In this video, I give you a beginner-friendly guide to creating your first D&D 5th edition character. I will be creating an elven rogue, but no matter what race or class you choose, you can follow along in the same basic process I take you through in this video. So let's get down to it. Hi everybody, my name is Nate and you are watching WASD20, a channel about tabletop RPGs and fantasy maps. It's fitting that this video on character creation is sponsored by Hero Forge, as they provide the best way for you to bring a D&D character to life in miniature form for your gaming table. At HeroForge.com, you'll find an amazing custom miniature designer with a whole bunch of races, tons of items, weapons, accessories, clothing, the ability to fine tune facial features, hairstyle, and poses. Seriously, my kids and I have spent countless hours playing around on this website. And after you've created your character just as you envisioned, you can order your mini in a variety of materials that will be directly shipped to your house. Or you can get the STL file to 3D print them on your own. They're amazing and they'll be perfect for that new character you're going to be playing. I actually ordered one for the character I created for this video and I'm really excited to get painting this thing. So anyway, go check them out right now at HeroForge.com. Today's video, D&D 5th Edition Character Creation for the Beginner. Now let me be upfront that if you're totally new to tabletop RPGs, this is not an easy, quick process, but it is a lot of fun and I definitely think it's worth it. Character creation is not just something we get through in order to play the game. It is actually a big part of what a lot of us enjoy about the game, creating a unique character that fits with our vision. It's one of the joys of fantasy, getting to escape our own reality for a bit and play the role of this character that we have designed and is perhaps very different from us. Us. That said, if you're totally new to it and this process is intimidating and you don't want to go through it, you just want to try playing the game, you don't have to create your own character. There are plenty of pre-generated characters out there. I'll put a link to some on my website down below and there's plenty available in other places as well. And there are also quick and easy character builder options. There's D&D Beyond, for example, that has a quick build option where you just kind of select your race and class and it spits out a character for you. Still, what we're going to be doing here is more the traditional method, building one from the ground up, using the player's handbook. Now that brings us to what do you need here? You actually do not need the player's handbook. There is a free basic rules PDF available, and I'll put a link down in the video description. It has a few less races and classes and other options, but it's still got a lot of variety. So if you don't have any of the books yet, definitely go check that out. That does include a character sheet, but I'll also put a link to a separate character sheet PDF down in the video description as well. You can also fill out a character sheet digitally, and I'll put a link to a video where I show you how I do that up at the top. All right, with that out of the way, let's get going. Step one, totally optional. Thinking about a character concept. Perhaps you start with a concept already in mind, and if you don't and you wanna skip this step, you can just start picking a race and a class and develop that concept as you go. But a lot of people do start with a character concept. They know that they want to play some kind of big bruiser, or they know that they want to play a sneaky thief type of character, or some kind of street thug who has had a religious conversion, or something like that. You get the idea. You can also try thinking about a fictional character that you really like, one from a favorite book or movie or a video game, and you can kind of build your character with them in mind, whether it's the mechanics and how they act in combat or in a party, or maybe it's just their personality. And really, you can pick some kind of off the wall ones, like uh, I want to play uh, George Costanza in D&D. I don't know what class or race that would be. Or Indiana Jones or Ellie from Last of Us. You get the idea. So for my character concept, I am going with the idea of some kind of street ruffian who knows Baldur's Gate very well. I'll be playing in Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus coming up soon, and I want to play a character who's kind of streetwise and is from Baldur's Gate. So that is my concept. The next step in the process, and possibly the first step, is selecting your race. So you can read more about the different races in the player's handbook or in the basic rules PDF. For me, I am going to be playing an elf, and I actually decided I'm going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to go with a drow, which is a dark elf. In the world of D&D, dark elves live in the Underdark, and they are far less common on the surface. It does say here on page 24 of the player's handbook that drow adventurers are rare, so check with your dungeon master to see if you can play one. And I did, and he approved. So here on page 21 of the player's handbook, we can read all about the elves and get some good background information, but we're going to skip to the part that is relevant to our stats and filling out this character sheet. 
So if we go to elf traits here on page 23, we can see that our, our dexterity score will increase by two. So for now, I'm just going to put a plus two here because we don't have our ability scores yet. We can read about age and alignment, which I'm not really going to get into in this video, but do understand that a typical elf reaches adulthood around the age of 100 and can live up to 750 years old. So maybe I'll think about my character pretty young, maybe 120, 150 years old. Now we certainly could record some of that information right here. So we could say 120, this is on page two or the backside of your character sheet. Uh, you can get into height, weight, eye skin, all that stuff here if you want to, but I'm not gonna bother right now. All right, for an elf, we can read that our base walking speed is 30 feet and that will be going right here. And that's how far we can move in one turn of movement. And we do have dark vision, so we will write that right here in this section for features and traits. And what I like to do is just put a little page reference here. This is on page 23. That way I can flip back to it if I want to know exactly what dark vision does and I don't have to write it all right here. It says here we have keen senses, which means we have proficiency in the perception skill. So for now, what we're going to do is we're just going to darken perception in on our skills, just like that. And we have Fey Ancestry, which means we have advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic can't put us to sleep. So I'll kind of summarize that right here. It says here that we don't need sleep. We have a trance. Instead, we deeply meditate uh, for four hours a day, uh, remaining semi-conscious. So anyway, that's an interesting thing just to know about elves. Languages. We can speak, read, and write common and elvish. Okay, so we can just put that in proficiencies and languages down in the bottom left here. We are proficient in common and elvish. And now we get to select our sub race, which is high elf, wood elf, or dark elf, which is the drow. And I told you already I selected the drow. So it says here we get an ability score increase plus one to charisma. So we'll go ahead and put a plus one right there for now. We have superior dark vision, so we actually have 120 feet of dark vision. Of course, that's because the drow are from the underdark. And we have sunlight sensitivity. You have disadvantage on attack rolls and on wisdom or perception checks that rely on sight when you, the target of your attack, or whatever you are trying to perceive, is in direct sunlight. Okay, so that's going to be a bit of a problem, but we'll manage. Now, it also says here that we have drow magic. And that means that at first level, we have access to the Dancing Lights cantrip, which I went ahead and wrote here on page three, the spell sheet. Now, in reality, I'm not going to be pay playing a magic casting class, so I would probably just write these on the first page of my character sheet somewhere under uh, features and traits. Uh, but if you're creating a casting class, you definitely want to keep track of all your spells on this page. Lastly here, we do have Drow Weapon Training, which means we have proficiency with short swords, rapiers, and hand crossbows. So I will write those down here in the bottom left under proficiencies. All right, that's going to do it for our race. You just want to make sure you're looking at the racial traits as well as any possible sub race traits. So the next step in the process is figuring out our class. Now I mentioned I'm going to be playing some kind of street ruffian from Baldur's Gate and uh, definitely was thinking that that fits well with the rogue, which I've actually never played in a campaign before and I'm really excited to give it a shot. So on page 94 of the player's handbook, you can read all about the rogue. The rogue is also in the D&D basic rules, so you can create one without buying the book. Lots of flavor text here all about rogues and helping you understand them, but basically they are skilled in stealth, they're often thieves or assassins, and they're just extremely resourceful, good at picking locks and things like that. So if we skip over to class features here on page 95, we can see that the rogue has hit dice of 1d8 per level. Since I am first level, I'll just be putting 1d8 right here. And of course that will go up as I level up, but our hit points are going to be eight plus our constitution modifier. So I'm gonna leave that blank for now because I don't know my ability scores yet. And um, then we go to proficiencies here. Proficiencies for the rogue here are light armor, and for weapons, we'll be adding a few to what we already have here. We also have all simple weapons. Hand crossbows we already have, but we also have now uh, long swords to add to the list here. So we can kind of separate out here. These are our weapons. Um, we have languages, weapons, and armor. 
We are also proficient with thieves tools. Now, a lot of people mess up and think that automatically means you get a set of thieves tool, but it doesn't necessarily. It just means you're proficient with it. For saving throws, we are proficient with both dexterity and intelligence saving throws. And then we have some skill proficiencies. We can choose four from acrobatics, athletics, deception, insight, intimidation, investigation, perception, performance, persuasion, sleight of hand, and stealth. Now, I definitely want to have stealth, so there's one. I'm already proficient with perception, so we don't need to worry about that. I think I will also do acrobatics. Uh, we'll do persuasion. And then we get one more, and I think we'll go with insight, actually. Now there's some notes here on equipment, but I'm actually going to hold off on that for now. For expertise, it says here that we actually get to pick two skills uh, that we can double our proficiency bonus with. So I'm just going to put a little star right here uh, as a note for myself that these ones are doubled. And we're going to go ahead and go with stealth, definitely. I love that skill. And we'll go with acrobatics too. All right, our next ability here on page 96 is Sneak Attack. Beginning at first level, you know how to strike subtly and exploit a foe's distractions. Once per turn, you can deal an extra 1d6 damage to one creature you hit with an attack if you have advantage on the attack roll. The attack must use a finesse or ranged weapon. You don't need advantage on the attack roll if another enemy of the target is within 5 feet of it. That enemy isn't incapacitated, and you don't have disadvantage on the attack roll. So uh, anyway, that's a little bit confusing, but we're not going to worry too much about it right now. Your DM can kind of help you figure out when that is, but we are going to write down here under features and traits, sneak attack. And we'll put 1d6 and kind of summarize a little bit. All right now, also on page 96 here, it looks like we get thieves cant, which is uh, basically a secretive rogue language. And there's a list of other things here that we get at higher levels like cunning action and a roguish archetype. But for now here at level one, we will be good. All right, the book also tells us that at this point we can record our proficiency bonus, which at level one is plus two. And it'll be that way for several levels. All right, now that's going to be it for our class information at this time. Next up, we need to determine our ability scores. And this is one of my favorite parts. Sometimes I'll actually start with this step. But there are a few different ways you can do this. One of them is to use the standard array. You can basically select these numbers here and just put them in where you want for your ability scores. Another way is to use the point by system, which they explain right down here. And then the last way is to roll for your ability scores. And that's what I am going to be doing. For rolling ability scores here, it says that we will be rolling four six-sided dice and then dropping the lowest, just taking the highest three dice jotting that number down on a scratch piece of paper. So I'm gonna switch cameras here and we'll roll the dice and see how we do. All right, so as I said, we're gonna be using 4d6 drop the lowest here. We'll be rolling them in this beautiful dice tray from Iron Archer Gamecraft, ironarchergamecraft.com. And uh, let's get going here. I've just got a pen and we'll be jotting them down as we go. All right, so we dropped the lowest, that's a one, and we're left with six plus five is 11. We can assign them to specific ability scores later. All right, wow, a lot of twos. So that one is gonna be a nine, not great on that one. All right, four plus six is 10. Whew, these are some low ability scores. All right, there we go, now we're talking. That's a 15, so that'll help. And uh, eight plus two is 10, oof. Could really use one more nice and high one here. Not bad. Okay, so that's 11 plus three is 14. Okay. All right, so those are our ability scores. Pretty mediocre overall, but anyway, let's go ahead and assign them to these specific abilities. All right, so with our ability scores rolled, now we have to assign them to specific abilities. So we've got strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, and wisdom. Strength, I think you know what that is. Dexterity is pretty self-explanatory. It's like agility. Uh, constitution is going to be how hardy you are. It generally is related to your hit points and also kind of like how much you can stomach and things like that. If you want to learn more about all these ability scores and the skills, I did do an entire episode of D&D &D Rule School about it, and I'll put a link right up at the top.
I think of intelligence as a little bit more like book smarts, whereas wisdom is a little more street smarts. The difference between being smart and wise, really. And charisma, of course, is your force of personality. So for each class, they do give suggestions on what you might want to do with your ability scores. And for the rogue, they definitely say you want to put your highest in dexterity. You don't have to. You can certainly go for a unique character concept. But for me, I am. So that's a 15, which uh, with my plus 2, I'm actually going to be putting here a, a 17. Okay, now there's some debate about whether or not I should be putting that right here or right here. But the default way that Wizards of the Coast has it in their pre-generated characters is to put the smaller number down here. So that's what I'll do. Cross off the 15 on my paper here. And next up, we've got a 14. That's our next highest. Now, I could put that in Charisma, but I kind of want to have high Constitution so my hit points aren't terrible. So I'm going to put my 14 in Constitution and cross off my 14 on my paper. Now I've got a 9, two tens, and an 11. It doesn't really matter too much at this point, but I think I will put my 9 in Intelligence. Um, I'm going to put my 11 in Wisdom. And that means Strength and Charisma will be a 10 each, but I have a plus 1 in Charisma, so we will make it an 11. And I'll go ahead and erase that. And there we go. Our Ability Scores are placed. These numbers will be the basis for a lot of other things, which we'll get to shortly. The next step in the player's handbook is to describe your characters. So you might think about their alignment, that's kind of their moral compass, but to do this, I usually like to use the character background section in the book, which is in chapter four, personality and background. So I don't use alignment too much, I just try to think of my character as an actual person and do consider their moral compass for sure. Uh, but there are a whole lot of backgrounds here. Now, if you're going with a rogue, there's a couple different directions that are kind of the stereotypical directions. A charlatan might be a good way to go because they're kind of a swindler, and that can fit well with the rogue. There's also, obviously, the criminal. That's going to be a big one for rogues. But you could go with one that's a little less logical, like maybe uh, a hermit or a guild artisan or a sage. You're basically trying to think about what did they do before they became an adventurer. So for me, I am going to be sticking pretty close to the uh, stereotypical rogue here with the criminal background. So as we look at the criminal background here, you can see we get skill proficiencies in deception and stealth. Now, when I'm looking through my background here, I can actually choose if I already have proficiency in these to just take different ones instead, and I can just choose at will. So I already have stealth, but I did mark deception here. So instead of stealth, I think I will actually go with survival. Let's go for it. We also get tool proficiencies. We've got one type of gaming set and thieves tools for a gaming set. I think I'll do something like um, dice. I'm proficient with dice. But you could do cards, you could do a chess set, things like that. We do, do get some equipment with this background. We get a crowbar, dark common clothes, which include a hood, and we get a pouch containing 15 gold pieces, which I will mark right here. This one is for gold pieces. Now, I'm not going to get into all the detail, but you do probably want to read your background pretty carefully. It can be very useful. A lot of these things you'll want to work with your dungeon master on. For example, criminal contact. You have a reliable and trustworthy contact who acts as a liaison, etc., etc. So that can be really useful. Work with your DM on that. There's the criminal specialty, which for me, I think I will probably choose a... Hmm, let's go with a smuggler. I like that. So for background here at the top, I am going to write criminal. And I will put in parentheses here, smuggler. Oh, and I didn't write my own name up there, so I'll do that. And then for all these personality traits, ideals, and bonds, I'm not going to go into detail on this. I'm just going to pick some that I think make sense for my character. If you don't want to do that, you can actually roll. It shows here that some of these are D6 or D8 charts. But you're supposed to choose two personality traits, one ideal, one bond, and one flaw for your character. And these can really help you role play your character and start to think about who they are as a person. All right, so there we go. I picked some personality traits. I picked an ideal uh, bond and a flaw. 
and um, those are again are going to help me role play my character. Now, I'm also just going to write my um, criminal contact ability down in my features and traits here and I'll write page 129. All right, next up, it's time to go shopping. We're gonna buy some equipment. And actually, we're gonna take the less shoppy route. There's two ways you can handle equipment here. You can take the standard equipment that comes with your background, which I already have right here, and your class, which we'll record very shortly here. Or you can forego all this, and you can say, actually, I'm just going to roll for gold. There's a chart in chapter five for that and go shopping myself and buy everything from the ground up. In my case, I am going to be taking the standard equipment and that's usually what I recommend for newer players. It makes it a lot easier. So on page 96, we have the basic equipment for the rogue. We get either a rapier or a short sword. So in this case, I think I'm going to take a short sword. The nice thing about a short sword is that I will be able to wield it with another weapon in my other hand. Then we get a short bow and quiver of 20 arrows or another short sword. Uh, I think in this case, I'm not proficient with short bows, unfortunately. So I think I will probably take just another short sword at this time. Now I could work with my DM and maybe substitute a short bow for a hand crossbow, but I think I'll stick to the two short swords at this time. And then I also get a burglar's pack, a dungeoneer's pack, or an explorer's pack. And in this case, I am going to take the burglar's pack, which has a lot of thief specific equipment and um, you can read all about what these packs include in chapter five but they generally do include some basic adventuring equipment like a bedroll and torches and a water skin and things like that and then we get leather armor and two daggers and yes we do get thieves tools very nice and you can see a description of what's included with the thieves tools in chapter five as well so that's pretty much it for our equipment. I could choose to take my 15 gold pieces over to chapter five and do a little shopping before the game and buy a few other items, but I think I'll call it good for now. Now, before we can figure out our attack bonus and our uh, armor class and things like that, it is time to determine our ability score modifiers and also our skill and saving throw bonuses. So the way that this works is we take our ability score. Let's take our highest one here, 17. And we are going to subtract 10, which leaves us with 7. And then we divide by 2, and that is going to leave us with 3.5. And we round down. So 3. Okay, so our ability score modifier for dexterity is plus 3. So we subtract 10, divide by 2, and round down if needed. So I'm going to go ahead and fill out the rest of these ability score modifiers at this time. All right, there we have it. Our next step is to carry those over to our saving throws and our skills. So the way that this works is that for strength, for example, we can just look at our strength bonus, which is plus zero. So we just leave it at zero. For dexterity, it's plus three, but I'm also proficient in dexterity saving throws. That's what that darkened in circle means. So now I get to add my proficiency bonus as well for a total of dexterity proficiency bonus plus five. The same thing is true for our skills down here, but remember I get double proficiency on some. So acrobatics, I put a star by double proficiency. So I actually get plus four for my proficiency bonus and plus three, so that's a total of plus seven for acrobatics. Animal handling, however, I have a wisdom score of zero and I'm not proficient with it, so we're just gonna leave it at zero. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and fill out the rest of my saving throws and skills at this time. All right, so we have all the saving throws and skill bonuses filled out. Now it's time to record some other things. A lot of the stats on our sheet are going to be based on these numbers. So let's start with armor class. You can look up your specific armor type in chapter five in the equipment section. I think it's on page 145. I noticed that leather armor has 11 plus dexterity modifier as your armor class. So for me, the dexterity modifier is three. So we're gonna go 14 for my armor class, 11 plus three. We can also determine our initiative bonus. That's just based on your dexterity bonus. And so that is also going to be plus three and that helps us determine how quickly we can get into combat. Hit points, we can do those while we're up here too. That is based on our constitution and our hit dice. 
So you can see that my hit die is 1d8 at first level plus 2. So that is going to be a hit point maximum of 10 using your constitution modifier. Moving on down the sheet, we can go to our attacks and spell casting. So for our weapons, short sword, you can look up the stats for your weapons in chapter 5 as well. For a short sword, it is going to be 1d6 damage, but we have to figure out our attack bonus. Attack bonus is how likely we are to hit. It's the number we get to add to our d20 roll when we make an attack to see if we hit. Now, the way that you determine your attack bonus and damage type is you are going to be basing it on the relevant ability score modifier. In most cases with a melee weapon, that is going to be strength. My strength is not very high, so that would be a problem which is why I want to look for weapons as a rogue that have the finesse property. You can read about those there on page 149 of the player's handbook where they have the full list of weapons. Short swords do have the finesse property, which means I can choose to use my dexterity instead of my strength for my attack bonus and damage. So that's really handy because my dexterity is plus three. So what I do is for my attack bonus, I take that plus three and I also add my proficiency bonus because I am proficient with short swords. So I will have a total attack bonus of plus five. For my damage type, I do not get to add the proficiency bonus. I just add the relevant modifier, which is still dexterity. So it's 1d6 plus 3. And the type of damage for a short sword is piercing. So I just put a P here. For my dagger, it is also a finesse weapon, so I'll basically be putting the same attack bonus there. But instead of 1d6, a dagger is just 1d4 plus three, also piercing. If I had any ranged weapons or like a cantrip spell that is really useful for attacks, I would probably put those here as well. But for now, we'll move on to the next part. And that is passive wisdom. You can see right here for passive wisdom, it says perception. So this is basically just going to be your perception bonus plus 10. So for me, it is going to be 12 because my perception is plus two. Well, everybody, I think that pretty much does it for our character here. Uh, you can absolutely go ahead and fill out parts of page two if you'd like to. You know, draw a character portrait or find one online. Uh, get into the character backstory stuff. Those are all good things to do. Uh, but for us here, I think the only thing we have left to do is name this character. And uh, when I was trying to think of names, I wanted something like short and easy to remember. Uh, something that kind of fit with a street persona. Uh, where you're just going to have a quick, short nickname. I'm not exactly sure what his full name would be yet, but I decided that his character name, his first name, would be Zed, uh, which is actually a nickname that I was given at one point. So there you go. And I think perhaps his real name is something a little bit more like Zedilus or I, I don't know, something like that. Uh, but he just goes by Zed. And the family name is Argith. So there we go, Zed Argith, a drow rogue from Baldur's Gate. Let me know if you have any questions about this down in the comments below. If you feel like I didn't explain something well or I missed something, absolutely let me know down there. I'd like to thank my sponsor once again for this video. Thank you to Hero Forge. They're amazing. Go check out their character builder. I actually had the chance to build my own character here for Zed. So uh, the miniature came in the mail the other day. I have it primed and ready to go. Turned out so great, and uh, I can't wait to paint this thing. And I hope to do that sometime on the channel in the next month. So definitely stay tuned for a new mini painting tutorial where I will be painting up our rogue Zed. And I also want to give a huge thank you to my patrons. Patrons are people who support this channel on a monthly basis. These people are amazing. They're making it happen for me here at WASD20. So thank you so much, patrons. Now, if you appreciate my content, if you find it valuable, I would love to have you become the newest member of the patron army as well. Just head over to patreon.com slash WASD20. There's some pretty cool rewards such as weekly live streams with me and a bunch of other stuff. So go check it out. I do hope to do another tutorial sometime in the near future with one of the casting classes so we can get into the basics of magic. So let me know if you have any suggestions for what that should be down below, whether it should be a, a wizard, a warlock, a sorcerer, a cleric, a paladin, 
uh, a druid, a bard. I'm probably missing one. But anyway, uh, let me know what you'd like to see down below. And uh, yeah, that's all for this one, everybody. Take care. You'll see me again very soon.